If a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to see it, does it obey the laws of linear perspective? Renaissance painters went to great lengths to incorporate linear perspective into their paintings. And we take it for granted because perspective is baked into every photograph that we take. A property of linear perspective is that objects look smaller the further away they are. It's more of a function of us as human beings, where we're standing and how we view the world. Objects don't really get smaller as they go further away, they just appear to, to our eyes. In this video, I'm going to make an argument that the world is distorted and we can correct it with a camera. An obvious example is in architectural photography. We know that the sides of a building are often parallel, but when we look up at a tall building, those sides are angled towards each other and converge into the distance. Because of perspective, it looks like it gets narrower the further away from your viewpoint you get. And that narrowing to a vanishing point is perspective. You could say that the photographer goes to great lengths to distort the photograph to make the sides of buildings parallel. But you could also make the case that the world is distorted and the photographer is just correcting it. When we're on the ground, roads like this vanish into the distance. But we know this road is roughly the same width from one end to the other, and we can confirm that from a map or if we look out of an aircraft window. We didn't have to modify a photo in this case, we just had to observe the world from a different position something that isn't our default couple of feet from the ground. The formal study of linear perspective dates back to the Renaissance with an architect called Filippo Brunelleschi. Leonardo da Vinci had copious notes on linear perspective, incorporating the way the eye works and how rays of light travel. Renaissance paintings used linear perspective not only to make more realistic spaces, but also to create leading lines to the focus of the picture. Artists throughout history have tried to get around the tyranny of linear perspective in different ways. And with the help of a camera, we can follow in their footsteps and see how they did it. A cube is a great way to visualize perspective. All the parallel lines on the cube will converge to a vanishing point in the distance, away from the viewer. And because those lines converge, it means we can never see the parallel sides at the same time. You can either see the blue side or the green side, but never both at once. Not unless I rotate the cube or you, as the viewer, walk from one side to the other. If you head over to the right, you'll see the blue side. And if you head over to the left, you'll see the green side. In a two-dimensional image, we can splice those together and something quite strange happens. The converging lines now point towards the viewer. Rather than things getting smaller with distance from the viewer, they get larger. It's larger at the back than it is at the front. Splicing an image of a cube like that looks reasonable. It's a reverse perspective picture. Everything's happening in the opposite way to what you'd expect. It gets a little clumsy, however, when we look down from the top. We've got to fudge away for the top to retain its character because essentially this was two images merged into one as opposed to a perfect reverse perspective image. I'm a massive fan of David Hockney, who experimented at length with reverse perspective. Check out this montage he made of Annie Leibovitz's car by stitching together multiple images as he moved around the vehicle. Just like with the Rubik's Cube, the car in this image is narrower towards us and wider further away. So that we, the viewer, just by looking at the picture, must have moved from the front to the back of the car to view it in this way. I think it's pretty spectacular how the artist has forced me as a viewer to move around this object. But again, it's clear that in each individual picture, the real world linear perspective of foreground and background objects acts to sabotage the reverse perspective effect. I made this reverse image of a building downtown and it's the background building that gives the trick away. I see it twice, once when I'm on the right hand side taking a picture and once when I'm on the left hand side taking a picture. We just can't shake off perspective. This sabotage becomes really apparent when we start taking pictures of humans. We have relief on our face and the different parts of our body stick out in different ways. Perspective is always there, even if we as a viewer are moving around another person. 
just like with pictures of buildings, it's useful to have some sort of line across which you can splice the pictures. In this picture of Hannah, I've used the line of her arms to split the picture taken from the front to the pictures taken from the sides. This is an image where the viewer is not just looking at a two-dimensional view of Hannah. It's actually a three-dimensional picture because you're able to view her from different sides. I think this picture works really well, but there are some instances where it doesn't hold up. Take this example of my hand. You can see it both from the front and the back. I think because it's a part of the human body and we're not used to seeing it in this way, it looks strange. It makes us feel uncomfortable. With this picture of Jonathan, the result is so alien to us that he almost looks like an alien. Which got me thinking, how do we take the discomfort away from a picture like this? And one way to do it would be to simply block off different parts of the picture. A little bit like we did with Hannah and her arms, but in this case, simply using black lines drawn onto the picture to split up the different panels. We're still seeing Jonathan from different angles, but this is way easier to digest. You could make the panels smaller and make more of them so that they look like cubes. And that's exactly what the cubists were doing. They were trying to get away from the tyranny of linear perspective and draw a subject from multiple different angles on a single 2D canvas. They were also trying to simplify to the point of abstraction. Hockney said that cubism was an attack on the perspective known and used for 500 years. But with a camera, we can go for a photorealistic version of cubism really easily. I took a whole series of images of Rachel from different angles of different parts of the body and brought them into affinity. It's quite fiddly, but with each image, I picked out the prominent parts and masked away the rest, sized it to put it in the correct place, and the end result is a cubist style picture. There's not just one vanishing point here. There are multiple vanishing points for each section of the image. That concept of multiple vanishing points is displayed really clearly in one of Hockney's pictures. This is a large interior from Los Angeles. Each object has a reverse perspective and the vanishing points are different for each object. The viewer is moving around the room in order to see all the different angles. At the same time, it's a weird, surreal picture of a room, but also a more realistic representation of the objects in a room when you're moving through it. This cubist montage is almost done. I've drawn on some black lines to separate the segments of the image and then some final treatments and the image is done. Cameras force linear perspective on us every time we press the shutter button in a way that took hundreds of years for painters to achieve. Painters can dismiss perspective if they want to, but photographers need to put in a considerable amount of effort to ignore or reverse the perspective built with the mathematics of Brunelleschi and da Vinci and challenged by Picasso and Hockney. Remember, there really is a vanishing point. And there really isn't a vanishing point. So go and have some fun with it.